Thais Hoerfost from Stony Brook, who will be talking about the uh, integral approach to the conformal bootstrap. Yeah, so uh, thanks, William, for the invitation to speak. That's my first time at Texas A&M. It's a pleasure to uh, see what it's all about. Uh, and yeah, I will talk today indeed about the conformal bootstrap that will be the, the overarching theme. So this is an activity that a lot of people have been uh, engaged in over the past couple of years. So it's a research program that attempts to make statements about conformal field theories in various space-time dimensions. So just using conformal symmetry and things like unitarity. Um, so it's a big field of research. And today I will try to go in a slightly unorthodox direction. So I will talk about some new research, partly in collaboration with Walton Ray. So one half of this talk will be based on a paper that appeared on the archive last week. The other half will appear next week, hopefully. Um, and it will be about a new framework to understand the equations of the conformal bootstrap. Uh, so let me first give a brief motivation about why we care about all this. Not all of us work in conformal field theories, but still they're, they're an important tool to understand all quantum theories. So uh, of course, people in our field in high energy theory try to map out this infinite dimensional landscape of, of theories. Most of them have a mass gap. But still, CFTs are a good place to start for two reasons. One, they describe the low energy regime of, of quantum theories, the end point of RG flow. So if you want to study phase transitions in spin systems or the quantum critical points in condensed matter, you're going to have some conformal variance. So like just under, making physical predictions about these, these interesting phase transitions falls within the, the realm of CFTs. But you can also think of CFTs as the starting point of RG flows. So if you take a conformally invariant theory, so the you know mass scale, then you can add a mass term or relevant coupling, and this will initiate some kind of renormalization of the flow. And there's a whole idea that if you understand the CFT very well, so if you know the spectrum of a CFT, if you know its dynamics, then you can use this as a starting point, as a tool to understand also the physics along the RG flow. So to make predictions about mass spectra, maybe about scattering amplitudes. Um, so in that sense, it would also be nice to have kind of a map or an atlas of all CFT to understand the properties in more detail. And finally, there's a slightly more provocative point that has to do with the, the current state of affairs in this, this field of the conformal bootstrap. Uh, so even if you take a completely difficult CFT, like the three-dimensional easy model as a critical point, so it's described by, by conformally invariant theory. But it's, uh, it's a theory that doesn't have any small parameters. So there's no perturbation theory that applies to it. There's no, no simple regime where you can, can make statements about it. So if 10 years ago you would ask someone, like, what can you say about the spectrum of 3D easing, then you should say that's probably completely random, right? If there's no integrability, there's no reasons to expect that the theory has some, some structure. But it appears that if you use these data that we have in the conformal bootstrap now, if you look at the spectrum of easing, then there is a lot of structure. There are a lot of patterns. Uh, of course, you have to think about it a bit. You have to read out the spectrum in the right way. But there is a lot of structure. And part of this structure uh, is understood now by something known as the light cone bootstrap. But it's very probable that there are a lot more patterns to be found still. So it feels like in this field of the conformal bootstrap, we're on the verge of discovering some more more patterns, and you can draw the analogy with, say, atomic physics, the way it was at the turn of the 20th century, when people were looking at the spectrum of hydrogen, and, and like finding that there are integer gaps in the spectrum there. So maybe in the bootstrap, we're also on the verge of, of finding a more complete description of, of these CFDs. And it's an exciting time to, to be part of this effort. Um, so let me give you a brief overview of what I mean when I talk about the CFT. It's not meant to be a technical talk, just to give you a flavor of, of the tools we use. So a conformal field theory for me is going to be a relativistic theory. So it has a Poincaré algebra. And then you, you say that it's a scale invariant theory. So there's no mass, mass parameter, which means that you get a scale invariance and an associated generator of dilatations for free. And then there's a folk theory that tells you if you have a, a unitary relativistic scale invariant theory that generically is lifts to the full conformal group. So you get D generators for free, these KUs that correspond to generators of special conformal transformations. So together these form a closed Lie algebra SOT comma two, 
well, it's of course a, a very simple group, so, so we understand the conformal symmetry very well. And there's one important note for the rest of this talk that the conformal group is SOD comma 2 is non compact. So it differs from groups like SO3 in a very essential way. And in the conformal groups, we, we don't talk about Lagrangians or Hamiltonians, we really talk about observable things. And observable things in local theories are, are correlation functions. So we talk about two, three, and four point functions that are, and they're already finite. So they're, they involve some local operators O, but you don't think of these as, as fields. You never have to worry about counter terms, about the realization of core ambiguities. We're always going to talk about uh, <coughs> correlators of, of these well defined operators. So they're the continuum limits, say, of, of lattice means. And these operators, they transform in a certain way under the conformal group, so they will have typically a Lorentz spin. If they're supersymmetry, they have some R symmetry function numbers maybe, but the most important one is going to be the scaling dimension. So that tells you how an operator transforms under a, a dilatation. And that's just a number delta O, so it's a positive real number. And that's going to be the, the only quantum number we really care about today. And it's kind of the counterpart of uh, mass in the Lorentz invariant in a normal Poincaré. So there are many differences between conformal field theories and normal quantum field theories. And the most important one is that CFTs have a lot of underlying structure. So the cleanest way to talk about the structure is to phrase it in terms of an operator algebra, which means that you can take two operators, O1 and O2, you can multiply them together, and this, this algebra tells you that you can expand this as a sum over all operators in the theory with some coefficients lambda. So this looks like very formal rule, but in fact it's, it's something much more powerful. So it really tells you that if you have an endpoint correlation function, you can take two operators inside such a correlation function, you can replace their product by the sum, and this will give you a well-defined convergent result. Uh, this is of course something we don't have in the normal quantum theory, so people who do QCD may know that there's a similar asymptotic expansion in QCD, but here this is an expansion that really works at finite distance. Q, uh, X minus Y is a, uh, the operators are a finite distance apart. So that's a very powerful property of this, this operator product expansion. Another thing is that these coefficients lambda, uh, they're not just some, some formal structure constant, they're just physical observables. So you can probe them by looking at three point functions in the CFT. You want to measure, say, the coefficient lambda 1, 2, 3, then you measure say, in an experiment the a correlation function O1, O2, O3, and you get this coefficient. So, although it looks a bit formal, this is a, a pretty simple tool that you can actually use in practice. And it's also important to notice that actually, because of this, uh, these lambdas are really all you can measure. So, if you start with an endpoint correlation function, you can use these tricks. Uh, iteratively, so you can use it multiple times, and at the end of the day, you just end up with the product of, of these lambdas. So there's a kind of theorem you can prove in CFTs that any observable, any local observable, just depends on these, these OPE coefficients, lambda 1, 2, 3, or lambda IJK, on the one hand, and on the other hand, they depend on the scaling dimensions delta, as I said before. So if you want to make an experimental prediction, those are the things you need to know. And in the bootstrap, we call these things CFT data because they codify all the experimentally uh, interesting stuff that lives inside a CFT. Um, so at this point, we actually need to talk about a few correlation functions. The conformal symmetry obviously restricts these in a very significant way. So, of course, these correlation functions can only be power laws since there, since there are no mass parameters. So if you look at a two point function, two operators, well, conformal symmetry alone tells you that this, this guy vanishes unless the two operators are equal. And if they are equal, they, they have to form a simple power law with an exponent that's fixed in terms of these scaling dimensions. The three point function is a bit more interesting. So again, it's a product of power laws in a way that's completely fixed by the conformal symmetry. But the conformal symmetry doesn't tell you the overall coefficient. And this overall coefficient is precisely this number lambda that I showed you on the previous slide. So to get something non-trivial, you have to look at four-point functions. And in the four-point functions, something a bit more complicated happens because if you have four points, x1, x2, x3, and x4, then you can build two ratios out of them. Where you 
for all years. So x12 means x1 minus x2. So these are just combinations of these four x's. Uh, they are invariant under conformal transformations. So if you do a rescaling, for instance, or a rotation, these two don't change. And it means that you can only fix such a four-point function up to a function of u and v. So conformal symmetry by itself does not tell you what a four-point function looks like. Uh, but at this point, uh, you should protest because two slides ago I taught you that we have this operator algebra that allows us to compute correlation functions. So if you look at a four-point function here, then you could say, well, let's just take these first two operators, O1 and O2. Let's multiply them out using the operator algebra that gives you a sum over all operators in theory. And then we do the same trick again. We also multiply out O3 and O4. So if you do this carefully, well, initially you get a double sum, but this double sum collapses. So you can write the result as a single sum over all operators in the theory. Every term is given by a product of these lambda coefficients up to something that's fixed by the conformal kinematics. But uh, in the 70s, people like uh, Polyakov, Ferrara, Gato Grillo, they, they realized that, well, this is not the only way to go about things. There is an arbitrary tro choice that you made in multiplying up 1 and 2 and later 3 and 4. So you can do this expansion in different ways. You can also say multiply out 1 and 4, and then 2 and 3. This gives you an a priori different expansion, right? So you get, again, a sum over all operators, but with different coefficients. Now lambda 1, 4 j, then 2, 3 j. But at the end of the day, we're computing something physical. We're measuring a four-point function. So these two different expansions give the same result. And that's really the, the key idea behind the conformal bootstrap, that by, by playing this game for every correlation function in theory, you find infinitely many constraints on these numbers lambda or ijk. And actually, if you're careful, you see that this is also a constraint on the spectrum, right? Because we don't know the spectrum in a typical CFT, so this is a simultaneous constraint on the delta k's and on the lambda ij k's. So this is an old idea. In the 1980s, it was used to well, solve essentially a lot of two-dimensional CFTs. In three dimensions, the situation was a bit more complicated than four dimensions, but uh, I'll talk about that a bit later on. So just to have something concrete in mind, uh, you can look at a four-point function of the same operator, so just some, some formal operator that I call sigma. You look at its four-point function. In this case, you see that you don't get a product of two different coefficients, but you get a square. So you get something positive, that's nice. Uh, you bring both sides of the equation to, well, to one side of, you, you bring both sides to the, both terms to the same side. So you get a sum over all operators in the theory with some, so these operators have some scaling dimension delta that we don't know a priori. They have some OB coefficient lambda that we don't know either. And then there's a difference of two special functions that we do know. So these special functions, G, they depend on the quantum numbers. They're completely fixed by conformal symmetry and we know, uh, call them conformal blocks. So they're kind of the uh, counterpart of say spherical harmonics for well, that you measure in, in atomic physics. So this is a sum rule, uh, and this is something that if you know these conformal blocks, and by now we do know how to compute them, it's something that you can just probe and see if you can make some predictions. So over the last couple of years, people have been very successful in making predictions using this sum rule, and the way you proceed is actually not by trying to solve this equation, because these conformal blocks are very complicated, it's, I mean, ideally, you want to guess a solution, as shown in the instrument, but it's, it's almost impossible to guess anything about a trivial solution to these equations. So how you make progress is you, you make an assumption about the spectrum, you guess, you make, you make some, yeah, you guess some scaling dimensions, say, and then you try to rule out the solution. So you say, given this spectrum, you try to prove that there's no way to choose the lambdas in such a way that the sum will hold. And that's in fact a much simpler problem. So that's something you can tackle using linear algebra or linear programming methods. Why is it enough to only look at some of those given dimensions? No, uh, you make an assumption about a few of them and then you're agnostic about the rest. And given, yeah, so that, 
That's a, the easiest way to do it. But you put a lower bound. Yeah, yeah you, you, you say I'm agnostic, you say, okay, let, this is a concrete case, so the, the 3D easing model. So in this case, you want to say something about theories with two relevant operators. So you say above dimension three, I know nothing, it can be anything, but below dimension three, let's, let's make some assumptions. So here in this case, uh, you're just two in two different scaling dimensions, delta sigma and delta epsilon. Yeah, so this is a plot made by Koss and Collaborate in 2014. And at every point in this plot, they try to rule out solutions. So when the plot is white, it means they can rule out the solution. They know that there's no CMT with these scaling dimensions. If the area is blue, they're agnostic about spectrum. They cannot make any concrete statements. So clearly you see this plot has some interesting features. So there's a small island here, and there's a big blue land mass. So this island is pretty interesting, and if you actually look at the scaling dimensions, then they hit on the nose the critical exponents of the three-dimensional easing model. So critical exponents that you can measure in the lab or using a Monte Carlo simulation. So in hindsight, you can conclude that just using the conformal symmetry, you, you've been able to make a prediction about scaling dimensions without ever using a Lagrangian or Hamilton. So this is really a very clean example of doing bottom-up physics. You just start from symmetry, also unitarity in this case, and you're able to make a concrete experimental prediction. And I do have to say, so this is an old plot. Uh, last year, the same group produced a much cleaner plot. So here you see that the scaling dimensions well, are restricted to this island, so there's an uncertainty of, say, uh, 10 to the minus 2, and I think right now the scaling dimensions are determined up to the fifth digit. So uh, the precision is extraordinary, and these conformal bootstrap methods are now setting world records in terms of accuracy compared to, say, Monte Carlo or other numerical methods. Uh, okay, so what you do is you have this sum rule on position space, right? So you apply a Taylor series, essentially. So the n max is the order in the Taylor series that you consider. The higher you go in the Taylor series, the better results, but the more computing time you need. So that's kind of the state of affairs in the uh, numerical bootstrap. And in my talk today, I want to take a step back and kind of rethink what we're doing here. So we have this nice sum rule position space, and I kind of showed you how, how in practice you can use this to, to make predictions about theory. And then, but okay, there are some other approaches. One thing is, is known as light cone or the Minkowski bootstrap. So here, what people did is analytically continue this from Euclidean space to Minkowski. And in that case, it turns out that you can make some predictions about the spectrum of CFTs at large spin. So you can make some analytical predictions. And the reason is that in this Minkowski limit, this light cone limit, these conformal blocks simplify a lot. So really, your Instead of working with these two parameters, you are turning it into a one-dimensional problem. So it's, it's a bit simpler from a technical point of view. So this is a very interesting direction of research, but I won't talk about it today. And there are also some more exotic ideas. So uh, one of these ideas is known as Mellon space. So this is a language that's, uh, well, the Mellon transform is just a mathematical tool, but Mellon space in physics means <coughs> means a language where instead of talking about four-point correlation functions, you map them to two to two scattering amplitudes in anti sitter space. So this is very closely connected to the ABS-CFT uh, correspondence. So a need for some types of conformal field theory, say with a, in the large N limit, uh, this is a very useful tool and gives you a lot of insight in, in how these correlators work, the insight in the inner workings of them. So, learn something about the effective actions in ABS, etc., just by thinking of these bootstrap equations in this, this new representation. And in fact, uh, recently, uh, people have also used Mellon space, like Gopa Kumar and collaborators, to produce uh, anomalous dimensions for the Wilson-Fisher fixed point up to three of the order, so this is already an extraordinary result, without computing a single Feynman diagram. So that's, that's something very happy about. So this is something to be explored. But again, it's not something I'll talk about today. Um, so 
I want to introduce a new space, a new transform for these correlation functions that we call alpha space. So let me, before introducing the technical details, explain what alpha space means. So alpha space draws its inspiration from the scattering amplitude language. For the following reason, scattering amplitudes naturally live on the complex plane, right? They depend on some Mandelstam variables, S and T. And you can analytically continue them. And well, complex analysis is a very powerful toolkit. So we want to exploit this to some extent. Another nice thing of Mellon is that, OK, Mellon space, you have these, these amplitudes. Uh, and actually, all of the physics is encoded in the analytic structure of these amplitudes. So scaling dimensions correspond to goals in the Mellon amplitude. And likewise, these OPE coefficients, or these co lambda IJKs, they are encoded in the residues of, of the poles. So all the, you can, I mean, the point is if you understand these amplitudes by themselves, then it's very easy to extract the experimental data. Um, on the other hand, Mellon has its downsides. So one of the reasons uh, is that the Mellon amplitude is very large. So roughly speaking, if you have a scattering amplitude, there's a single pole for every exchange state. And in the CFT, there are, of course, infinitely many states. But as you know, if a theory has a symmetry, then states are organized into representations of the symmetry. So in the CFT, it means that states are organized into multiples, conformal families or conformal multiples, however you want to call them. And the transformation laws of all of these states are really already encoded into those of the lowest weight state. So ultimately, it would be much nicer to have an object that only has one pole for every conformal family corresponding to this lowest weight state. And that is precisely what this alpha space uh, is going to give us. So rather than talking about these very complicated conformal blocks, I will in detail walk you through a toy example. And then I'll be a bit more hand wavy with the physically relevant uh, bootstrap equation. So let's let, let's focus at the toy example. So here I'm looking at a bootstrap equation that does not have two cross ratios like u and v, but that has a single cross ratio x. So this is an equation that lives naturally in <coughs> the unit interval. So it's going to be sum over all operators, k. Uh, every term is going to be a power law x to the delta k, and there's going to be a coefficient pk. That's just going to be the form of the correlation function in this toy example. And then we're going to impose crossing symmetry. So crossing symmetry, the typical CFT, uh, it's encoded as a functional equation of this form. So it relates f of x and f of 1 minus x. And the two are related by some, some power law, x of 1 minus x to, to delta phi. So the physical CFT delta phi will be the scaling dimension of, of a physical field. Here it's just a formal label that we use to, to understand these constraints. So if you bring these two together, this conformal block decomposition and the crossing equation, then you can write the result as a, well, as a sum in this form. So now it's, it looks like kind of an Olympiad problem. Like how, what can you say about, can you solve this equation? Of course, there are many, many, many solutions to this equation. Uh, one way to proceed is say, to try to express the, these conformal blocks on the right-hand side in terms of these x to the delta. So that gets you somewhere, it gives you a few simple solutions, but of course that's not really the way to move forward. So what we do in alpha space is uh, we try to phrase everything in terms of stool equal theory. So we don't think of, well, we think of these blocks as eigenfunctions of a certain differential operator. So I just here, I guess some differential operator D, such that this equation holds where C is the Casimir eigenvalue of a D-dimensional state of scaling dimension delta. So this is just a formal trick, but it makes makes it look like an equation that would hold in a d-dimensional CFT. But if we're looking at factor of two in front of x to the power of two. Yes, I've definitely forgotten. Uh, and also. Yeah. So. You have to. Yes. Thanks for noticing. Yeah. This is the the right convention. Um, so. Yeah, so there is the second order differential equation, and we're going to develop a stool linear field theory of this, this operator D. So the first thing you do when you do stool linear field theory is you write down an inner product with respect to which the operator is self-adjoint. And in this case, you get a very simple inner product, and just a single power law, 1 over x to 
plus one. <coughs> That's going to be the starting point. And we're going to try to construct an orthogonal basis of functions with respect to this, this inner product, a new uh, So that's something I'll leave as an exercise to you. And what you get is uh, these peculiar linear combinations of power laws. So you get x to the d over 2 plus alpha plus x to the d over 2 minus alpha. But you see that you have to choose alpha to be imaginary in order to get normalizable solutions. So you get this just by looking at the asymptotics by both ends of the interval by imposing the constraints at x equals to 1 and x equals to 0. This is just what you find. And the whole framework of storm field theory tells you then that you can decompose any position space function f in terms of these, uh, these functions u of alpha. And so we're going to map fx in some sense to a density f of alpha that's going to encode all of the features of f. So here I wrote this in a pretty fancy form, but it's like this is the way you write down mellon amplitudes. Normally you write them as integrals along the imaginary axis. Um, so this is the kind of the end of, this is all you need to know about the sturm liouville problem of this particular equation. And it has a very nice property name that if you uh, pick up, if you actually compute f, then you recover you recover this decomposition in a simple way. And we close the, say, say f is a neuromorphic function with a bunch of poles on the right half plane. You close the contour using Cauchy's theorem. You pick up these poles. And it's a, a short exercise to show that indeed the, the residues of these poles, they map to these EK coefficient from the previous slide. So that's, that's easy to see. And that explains why the Stumlioville theory of this operator, of this D toy, was the right thing to use. I mean, you can decompose a function to any basis, right? There's no, no preferred choice, a priori. But if you want the analytic structure of F to tell you about uh, the delta k's and the e k's, then you have to choose this, this specific differential operator adapted to these x to the delta blocks. Is the order of your differential operator related to the property of those two pieces of data? Uh, no. K of delta K? Why is it called Poisson? Uh, why is it second order? Well, I, here it's second order because the, the Casimir, normally Casimir equations in CFTs are second order. So they're... Uh, well, why is it the Casimir equation? No, I just call it the Casimir. Like, I, I want to match to this, this Casimir eigenvalue. So I will, this yeah, is second order. Yeah. I should have asked back here. Yeah. Why is D toy a second order differential operator? Why well, I, because it's only because I want to match this form. So this is quadratic and delta. That's so true. you have to hit it twice with, with derivative. And there's a small pedagogical note. That this is really just a Fourier cosine transform. So I, it appears very fancy, but at the end of the day, it's it's all mathematics. Uh, and here, but now okay, we're going to some real physics. So we know that this function f is not arbitrary. We had this crossing constraint. So we have two pieces of information. And we know that we can express f as an integral over these, these functions u alpha. We know that f obeys a functional equation. So you can easily bring the two pieces together. And when all the smoke clears, you find that the density at alpha obeys an integral equation. That's going to be the key message today. So f of alpha, you can write it as an integral, again, along the imaginary axis of some kernel that depends on alpha, alpha kernel k alpha beta times f itself. So this is a very non-trivial constraint on, on this density f of alpha. So there are a few things to notice. First of all, this kernel is a completely universal object. I mean, it just depends on the quantum numbers. In this case, it depends on delta phi in the space-time dimension d. That's also going to be the case in realistic CFTs. And the nice feature is that we have completely integrated out, as I say, your position space. So there's no more x anywhere. There are no more conformal blocks. You're really extracting, in some sense, the, the, some abstract properties of, of this crossing equation. k for is an ABS property. It's a property of ABS space k Okay, I'll go, I'll, I don't know, but I, I have it on the next slide, so uh, if it is, then... Okay. Yeah, so 
if you if you're going to like remember one frame from this talk, it's that by using this alpha space framework, you can talk about crossing symmetry, about bootstrap equations in, com in complex plane, in bootstrap problem becomes equivalent to finding a mirror morphic function that obeys a certain integral equation. That's going to be the take home message for today. So here I don't know whether if this is what you meant, so you can in this case work out this, this curve more explicitly. Um, so you find that it well it's a sum of free order beta functions, so each term you can write in terms of gamma functions, uh, and they they just depend, as I said before, on, on alpha beta and these quantum number delta phi in the space time dimension. So this is what it is. Uh, you may have thought it would be a random looking matrix, but in fact these have very simple analytic behavior. So the string theorists will recognize this kind of as the, the Venetiano amplitude. It's a bit more complicated, but it's essentially it has the same functional property. So say if you fix beta, then you can look at the MLA structure of this guy in terms of alpha, you see that it has integer space poles. Uh, and actually the, the residues at these poles are polynomials. So very non-generic, and they obey some kind of duality relation. So you can think of this as a matrix with indices A and B, alpha and beta. You can take the transpose of this matrix, and it obeys some funny, uh, funny equation. And finally, okay, since since it's a crossing equation, essentially if you look at k squared, it should be equal to one. And in this case, it translates into some orthogonality and completeness conditions for for this kernel. So the lesson is that these girdles have very, as complex functions, they have very simple properties. That's an interesting thing about the scale and weight being exactly like the core of these people. So That's interesting. Normal, okay. Normally you have, uh, you see the right, if you look at realistic bootstrap equations, you see V minus delta phi appearing on the right hand side. So uh, I don't really know what the, and ultimately, this is just the equation I, I cooked up. Uh, it comes out of thin air, so there's no reason why it should obey any. You're making a point that it obeys duality relation because in, in, yeah, because it, in the yeah. real case it does. Yeah, in the, yeah, in the real case, uh, yeah. But I mean, it has to do with the fact that these are, in some sense, unitary maps between, so we have a complete basis of functions of, of the u a axis, sorry, u alpha axis. U beta 1 minus x. So you can think of this kernel as a unitary map that tells you how you can map one of these sets to the other. So that's why it has a unitary property. And how did you pick delta phi? I just input like there was this there's this prefactor in the, in the process. So this is the definition of delta phi. It's just some number. What does crossing symmetry look like in alpha space? Uh, this is it. So it's, it's it's an integral equation with a kernel kernel k that can be worked out. So that's that's some analytic uh, analytic function. So yeah. So this this is the position space version. This is the alpha space version. So it's a very these these equations have exactly the same content, but they're packaged in a very different way. Okay, so in the rest of this talk, I'll give a few more realistic examples of these uh, crossing equations. And the main difference is going to be that, okay, before we had a single power law, x to the delta as a conformal block, and in real life CFTs we have uh, real conformal blocks. So these real conformal blocks have, are some infinite sums normally of x to the delta plus n. So they're, they're typically hypergeometric functions. So you can think of them as infinite sums with some coefficients g n that are completely fixed by conformal symmetry. So they, they just depend on the space that I mentioned the quantum numbers. So morally speaking, everything I'm going to do from now is just going to be a resummation of the, the results of this toy kernel in a clever way. So we're going to find some, some kernels corresponding to say boundary CFTs or CFTs in projective spaces, but ultimately you can think of them as just dressed up versions of, of this toy kernel. And still toy kernel because you don't have both uh, u and uh, the, the crossing invariant. Oh no no. And uh, the, the conformal 
No, I call it a toy kernel because it doesn't for I mean uh, because there's I mean there's no conformal symmetry there. It's just a formal it's just a formal crossing so equation. What you're, you're saying realistic kernels they should depend on two invariants. No, okay. I mean we're, we're going to look at three cases today. So one dimensional CFDs, CFDs that live on a line. If they live on a line, then the kinematics is so constrained that there's only one cross ratio. In other cases, uh, say if you look at the boundary CFT, you only have two point functions. In that case, you can, if you have two points x and y, you can only build a single cross ratio. So again, you find a bootstrap equation that just depends on, on some x. Uh, yeah. So of course, the, it turns out there's some beautiful mathematics along the way. So we're not going to read some brute force, we're going to do it in a clever way. So uh, in the first part, uh, the first example I'm going to give, I'm giving a bit of a weird example. So we're going to take a d-dimensional conformal uh, theory and put it on d-dimensional projective space, or the cross gap as it's called. So from the point of view of particle physics, this is a weird thing to do. But people who know string theory know that uh, in string theory, this is actually something that's considered in real life when you look at unoriented strings. Uh, so in 2D, 2D CMTs, this fits into a more well-known mathematical framework. But we're going to be interested in a d-dimensional case. I'm not going to devote any more time to the 2D case. So in the d-dimensional case, why do we care about this, this cross step? There's essentially two reasons. One has to do with holography. So you can ask yourself the question, ADS C of T, say I take a point in the D, D plus one dimensional ADS bulk, then what does this correspond to on the C of T side? And the answer turns out to be a cross gap state. So state that naturally lives in this cross gap C of T. Um, and another reason to be interested in this has just to move a quantum field theory. So you get some, we're going to get some crossing equations in it turns out that you can also study some flat space physics using these crossing equations. So Nakayama recently he computed the one loop anomalous dimension in the Li Yang model using these cross gap equations. So there is some some flat space physics there. Um, so technically speaking, there are some weird things going on, and they mainly have to do with, with how you implement conformal symmetry. So what you do, projective space is defined as taking the sphere, identifying typical points. Of course, we prefer to work on flat space, so you map down using the stereographic projection, and then this identification becomes identifying the point x and the point minus 1 over x. Uh, so this is a bit unpleasant to do because it breaks part of the conformal group. So rather than having SOD comma 2, you get SOD comma 1. Uh, so correlation functions are more complicated. One point functions vanish in the CFT, but one point functions can have some are parameterized by some fev ai in, on the cross cap. Uh, four point functions are out of the question, but two point functions can be studied in these models. So if you take a two point function O1, O2, then they depend, as I said before, on a single cross ratio. So we're going to study these these two point functions with some scale factors to develop that again naturally live on the interval zero comma one. So they obey a crossing equation which comes just from the fact that if you take every two point function, say phi phi, you can take one of the points, say phi x, move it to its mirror point at minus one over x, but these two points are identified, so evaluating these two point functions in either this way or this way should give you the same result. So that's how you get some non-trivial consistency condition of the two point function. And it has precisely the form I predicted before, so the, the correlation function f, you can write it as a sum of all operators in the theory with some experimentally interesting, uh, well, experimentally is up in the air, but some interesting <laughs> coefficients and some conformal blocks that are hypergeometric functions. Um, but if you could expect this to work for some, you know, projected, let's so take the whole CFT and <coughs> look at the part that's invariant under Z2, right? This one, this part of it would work for that. Precisely. So, yeah, I mean, this trick applies to any CFT, right? You don't have need to have you don't have to have some some special C you can even put like the easing model on the on the cross of this. <coughs> so here for the first time we have to deal with the strong field theory of a real Casimir operator. So these conformal blocks G they obey a second order differential equation. 
they're not good basis functions themselves because they blow up as you, you go to 80 equals to 1. But if you're careful, you can construct a good basis of functions that I call phi alpha here. Uh, and you find it just by integrating the Casimir equation. And as before, you're going to map these position space functions to some alpha space functions. They are defined just by integrating f against these basis functions. And there's a kind of cute mathematical theory that has to do with this integral transform. So there's a more general picture. It was developed by a Dutch mathematician, Hornwinger, uh, back into the 1970s. And there's also a small picture to explain <coughs> what's going on. So this is very similar to the Fourier transform. In this plot, well, first I draw a conformal block. And you see a conformal block is just a positive function. And it blows up as you go to one side of the interval. So it's clear these conformal blocks, they can never be a good base. Because if you integrate them against each other, you just get infinity. But here you see two of these phi alphas, these basis functions. And you see that they're just oscillatory. And if you change alpha, then the rate of oscillation changes. So this is really like plane waves if you try to squeeze them into a box. And see the same thing. That explains why, why if you integrate two, two of these phi alphas with different alphas against each other, you get zero. So it's it's just a dressed up version of the Fourier transform. What's, what's happening in that space when it goes to one? Uh, no, the blocks term by term have a, are singular. They have like one minus x to the. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. they have. Eta is like one of the yeah, so sorry, yeah. x to the yeah. power? Yeah, eta is now, oh, sorry, what was x is now eta. Yeah, these blocks behave like 1 minus eta to like eta d over 2 minus 1. If I'm not mistaken, as eta goes to 1, so. Um, yeah, there's a small, uh, so we're going to, you can represent correlation function in terms of these functions by introducing some density in a number G alpha. And there's a small group theoretical remark for the, for the aficionados here. And you can manipulate this integral and write it as an integral over all states in the theory. The scaling dimension d over 2 plus something imaginary. So these are unphysical states from the point of view of the CFT. The CFT those are real scaling dimensions. But in the group theory of SOD, comma 2, these uh, make a lot of sense because they're known as the unitary irreducible principle series. So the fact that you're, in essence, this means that you're decomposing the correlation function in terms of irreps of, of SOD, comma 2. Of course, we didn't use this derivation. We just used full new deal theory. But it does hint at the fact that there should be an honest group theoretical way to derive the same result. Uh, so that would be interesting for the future. At this point, we can look at the crossing equation in alpha space. So again, we have these two ingredients. We have crossing equation and alpha space decomposition. Bringing the two together, you find that this, this density, g of alpha base, an integral equation of precisely the same form as this toy example, except that there's a slightly more complicated kernel this time. Uh, so you can compute the kernel. It's just an integral. And if you work it out in detail, you find that it can be written as the sum of two hypergeometric functions of the 4F3 type. So they have seven parameters. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a big beast. That's why I didn't put the formulas here. But it is what it is. So it, it get, And it has pretty simple analytic properties. So it, its poles and residues are, are very regular. There's no, there's no, no mystery here. Um, and finally, it turns out to be fruitful to, again, manipulate this a bit further. So rather than writing down this crossing equation in this form, you can write it as an eigenvalue equation. So if you introduce uh, an integral operator, big L, that just consists of integrating some function f against the kernel, then crossing symmetry just says that g is an eigenfunction of L with eigenvalue 1. So in some sense, you turn it into a linear algebra problem. Normally, this wouldn't buy you much because this, this integral operator is a pretty obscure thing. So you're integrating the function against the sum of two hypergeometric 4F1 functions. So who in their right mind would uh, consider this thing? It turns out that some mathematicians have considered this. So uh, there, there are two papers by, again, a Dutch mathematician, Hunnevel, 
who has analyzed a class of integral transforms. Uh, and this, this projective space, cross internal, is just one example of this class of examples he considered. So, um, so there is an all mathematical theory behind it. And it means that we're very lucky because we can formulate some rigorous theorems about the solution. So there, there's at least some, some framework to understand these, these alpha space crossing equations. And in particular, we can borrow some concrete results. So in the case of, of this cross gap, we can construct some solutions to crossing directly in alpha space. So what do they look like? Well, they're a product of two gamma functions. And these gamma functions, of course, they have integer space poles multiplied by a polynomial. And these polynomials, we can write down their exact form, but they're not so interesting. So they're exact eigenfunctions of, of this operator L. Uh, and that means that we get uh, infinitely many solutions to crossing symmetry for free. So already this identification with, with this Wilson transform by Blumenfeld, it has given us some, some new physical information. And you learn some more if you actually look at what these solutions look like physically. So they, they have an integer space spectrum, so they don't really correspond to interacting physics. But still, you see there, well, if you look at the case of a, two, a more general two-point function of two different operators, that mentions delta 1 and delta 2, and you see that these operators look like double traces in ABS CFD. So the spectrum of, of this kind of special solution to crossing symmetry it has an ABS flavor to it. And it would be obviously be interesting to, to work out this uh, in more detail to see what these really look like. Um, and finally, I will talk about, uh, well, this is a, a more bootstrappy problem. So the, the mathematics is going to be the same, but the physics is a bit different. So here we're going to look at a four-point function, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, living on a line. So these are defect CFTs. Of course, they, they're experimentally relevant, etc. I won't have time to talk about those, uh, about those aspects. And this is precisely the same bootstrap picture that I explained in the beginning. So in this case, you get a constraint because you can compute this four-point function in two different ways. You can multiply phi 1 and phi 2 first, then phi 3 and phi 4, or you can do it in a different order, say phi 1 and phi 4 and phi 2 and phi 3. So there are two different decompositions of the same four-point function. One of them we call the S channel, and one of them we call the T channel. And conformal symmetry, uh, yeah, the bootstrap means that you have to require that these two decompositions get the same result. So in this case, there's not one strongly good problem to solve, there are two different ones. One corresponding to the S channel, one corresponding to the T channel. So you get two different bases, psi S and psi T. And these are a bit more complicated because now they depend on four quantum numbers, H1, H2, H3, H4. These quantum numbers, they're just the scaling dimensions of these guys divided by two. So there's kind of a double student in blue problem, uh, but still it fits into the same framework. So you can define the kernel, K of alpha and beta, which also depends on these quantum numbers. I thought that your previous eigenvalue problem was a rephrasing of the crossing symmetry. Yeah, but this is different. Uh, uh, so now you have two, you're doing, getting two of these equations Okay. But it's the same crossing symmetry. It will be a two, two, two by two system of crossing equations, but you'll see it on the next slide. So in any case, you have, you have this kernel, and you can think of this kernel as taking this like graphical representation of these T channel eigenfunctions. And you can you realize this function is a linear combination as an integral over the S channel ones. So in this case you really see that the kernel is a unitary map between these two sets of eigenfunctions. So this is just the mathematics, and this is what it looks like in terms of the physics. So physically speaking, we have two different amplitudes this time. Fs of alpha, which tells you about the CFT data appearing in the S channel decomposition, so the scaling dimensions and the OP coefficients on one side, and Ft of alpha encodes the CFT data on the other side. In the previous case, we had a single eigenvalue equation, and here you see that it has become a two-to-two -two system of, uh, of integral equations. So the mathematics is a bit more complicated, but 
it has the same flavor. You can work out these, these two different kernels, and perhaps surprisingly, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, the result is again the sum of two of these hypergeometric functions. And again, as before, they fit into this, this mathematically rigorous treatment uh, from these, uh, these papers. What, you say two different kernels? They look like the same kernel. Oh, precisely, so that's why I say, well, yeah. I mean, once you know one, you know the other, obviously, so. Um, and again, there's this, uh, this infinite set of mean field solutions to crossing symmetry that we get for free. And again, if you look at a degenerate case, so if you take phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and phi 4 to be equal, this 2 by 2, uh, two to 2 system, it collapses, it becomes an eigenvalue equation, just as the one we had before. <coughs> So that essentially includes the, what I wanted to say about the 1D part. And finally, you can also look at <coughs> one more different setting uh, of conformal variance. So now you look at the CFT in D dimensions that's defined on one half of Euclidean space. And on the boundary, which is a D minus one dimensional space, you impose some conformally invariant boundary condition like Dirichlet, Neumann, whatever. So again, these are well studied. And of course, they're experimentally very relevant because a lot of the systems we study fall into this, this description. And uh, you get constraints on crossing symmetry for the following reason. Well, not crossing symmetry, you get constraints on boundary conditions for the following reason. That these CFTs have two different descriptions. So you can think of bulk degrees of freedom. There's a bulk Hilbert space, and this Hilbert space is complete. So you can describe anything you want in terms of, of these bulk degrees of freedom. but the boundary, this d minus one dimensional CFT, has a Hilbert space of its own right. So whenever you want to compute something, you can choose which description you want to use. But at the end of the day, since both the bulk and Hilbert, uh, bulk and boundary Hilbert spaces should give the same result, you get some non-trivial constraints. So in two D again, these constraints are well studied. There's a whole theory of them. And in D dimensions, uh, well, there have been numerical bootstrap uh, papers, but they're not as well as four. So here's what it looks like in a bit more detail. So again, we're looking at the two-point function phi phi that depends on a single cross ratio zeta. I chose this cross ratio of zeta precisely because it maps to the unit interval. So that's nice from the strongly view point of view. And we have a, this is the, going to be the crossing equation. So we have the sum over all bulk operators okay with some coefficients here, some bulk of form blocks. It should be equal to sum of all boundary operators with some different coefficients b squared and some boundary of form blocks. So this is schematically the form of these consistency conditions and boundary CFTs. And if we want to turn this into an alpha space problem, we're going to have to solve a strong Newton problem. And as the one before, there are going to be two separate strong Newton problems, so you need to find the basis of eigenfunctions corresponding to the ball conformal blocks and to the boundary conformal blocks. So schematically, this is what it looks like. I draw the bulk eigenfunction here in blue and the boundary eigenfunction here in red. So crossing symmetry just means that you have two decompositions of an amplitude f bulk of alpha and a boundary amplitude f sigma, and you should get the same result. Once more, you can introduce two different crossing kernels that relate these boundary and bulk eigenfunctions. Surprise, surprise, if you work out what these crossing kernels look like, they're the sum of two hypergeometric functions, and they fit this, this framework uh, of the Wilson transform. Uh, so I could leave it at this, but there's a, a nice little theorem to prove. Uh, and that has to do with, say, the holistic interpretation of this, this crossing kernel business. So we have encountered different cases. We have this cross gap, this projective space kernel. We have the bulk, the boundary, and we have a one-dimensional CFTs. So we have four different scenarios. Roughly speaking, these kernels look the same, but is there a kind of unifying picture that, that we can use to understand them uh, in more generality? And it turns out that well, there is such a picture as a surprising theorem. You can prove mainly that 
this one dimensional kernel generalized to all of the others. So you, which means that you can express, say, this cross cap kernel in terms of the one dimensional guy if you assign, uh, well, if you choose these parameters h1, h2, h3, and h4 in a careful way. And the same holds for the ball and boundary. And this is, gives you some very non-trivial result, namely that if you know how to solve one-dimensional bootstrap equations, you know how to solve boundary and cross-cap solutions as well. I think this is already kind of a vindication of the alpha space technology for the following reason that in alpha space, this is something that's pretty simple to show. This is like the one-line computation to check that this works. But in position space, uh, well, in hindsight, we could have predicted it. In hindsight, it's easy to see that this holds. But it wasn't obvious for the following reason that if you work in position space, there are a lot of ambiguities in the sense that, I mean, it's not clear which coordinate you should choose. You can choose any coordinate and it will change the form of uh, the bootstrap equations. Often you can rewrite the same conformal block in different ways using hypergeometric identities. So there's a lot of freedom here. And by passing to alpha space, we kind of extracted the, the essence of these bootstrap equations. We cast it into a simple analytic form, and that allowed us to see that this, this funny lemma holds. I think this is already one nice application. There is, however, still some mathematical mystery behind this, for the reason that this object, K, this one-dimensional crossing kernel, it ultimately has to do with the representation theory of SL2, the conformal group in one dimension. So you can think of it as the 6J symbol or the Raka symbol that you may know from, say, atomic physics. But these other crossing kernels, they come from different groups. So they have to do with SOD, comma 1 or SOD, comma 2 group theory. So the fact that you have these objects that have a di very different representation theoretical meaning, that they're identical, is a mystery that, uh, that should be explained at some point. But since we just derived it using Storm and real theory, it's, it's not obvious how this happens. So that's for the more mathematically minded people to show why this works. And that's the essence of what I wanted to say today. So the moral of the story is that normally we look at these CFD bootstrap equation position space. For numerics, it's been a very fruitful enterprise, so it's definitely not something that we should discard. But by passing to alpha space, we can see them in a completely new light. So the CFT data are encoded in a simple way in this alpha space framework just as poles and residues. And you can turn a position space bootstrap equation into an integral equation on a complex plane. So that's the, the main idea of alpha space. A nice feature of the example we're studying today is that these integral equations are understood, at least to some extent. There are some limitation uh, in the usual sense because these integral transforms are understood as unitary maps between Hilbert spaces of square normalizable functions, just like the Fourier transform. So mathematicians understand these equations very well within these L2 domains. But if you want to look at really interesting physics, you have to slightly move out of these domains. So we cannot just rest on our laurels. If you want to really find some analytic solutions to say crossing symmetry, you have to go beyond these, these simple L2 analysis. You have to kind of push the envelope. Uh, I think there's a, a group theory exercise to be done in general. So as I told you before, these kernels have a group theoretical meaning. And you should be able to derive them just using you know, representation theory. So people who work with your sort of CFTs know that uh, there's a famous story about the co-product there, developed by Moore and Cyberg you should be able to recycle that logic to derive the same results. And I think that's a very interesting thing to do. <coughs> we didn't do it, we just used to be new theory. And finally, there are a lot of generalizations. So the equation I talked about today were nice, but ultimately they don't, we're not that passionate about cross-cap bootstrap equations or boundary CFTs. Ultimately, we want to solve three, four, five, six-dimensional CFTs in flat space. So roughly speaking, the same mathematical ideas apply, but their implementation is going to be more difficult for the reason that there are two cross ratios. So you don't get the single integral equation 
we'll get at best like infinitely many coupled equations or double integral equations if you wish. So the same ideas apply, but actually working them out in detail is going to be a lot harder. And of course, there are also different generalizations. You can say look at the 1D case at supersymmetry. So rather than working with SL2, you're going to get OSP groups. That should be a tractable problem, actually. Another thing is you can look at spinning external states. So today I talked about why skip. Would you expect the rank to be two? No, uh, OSP. Uh, or why would you not expect the rank Oh, no, yeah. Uh, yeah, it would be. It wouldn't, it wouldn't sound like so crazy. No, 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 it's not crazy at all. That's, that's a doable, uh, I mean, that's a tractable exercise. Uh, yeah, so here I mean that you can, uh, I mean, you can look at, say, two-point function of currents or stress tensors, boundary CFTs or on the cross gap. Uh, so that would teach you some new information about CFTs. It would require some slightly new mathematical machinery, but it would not be as complicated as looking at this d-dimensional four-point function. So that would be the first exercise to be done. And finally, you can ask, so where, where do we go from here? If we are too lazy to actually compute this d-dimensional object, so I think that there are, there are, roughly speaking, two things to do. One is to realize that a lot of these things have in some context already studied. So in two dimensions, there's a famous non-compact CFT known as the Liouville CFT. And many results about this theory are known. So we know how to put it on the cross cap. We know its boundary conditions. Like, it's an exactly solved theory. But in many ways, it behaves just like these, these examples I showed you. So I think it would be a very interesting exercise to cast these results about the new real theory to our formalism and just to see what it gives you. Because maybe you can kind of manipulate these, these new real results and get some new physics out of them. I think that would be something for the more analytically minded people. And finally, you can also try to get more heuristic results. So we have some integral equations that are completely explicit. So at this point, you could just start trying manipulating these, these equations and maybe to get heuristic constraints or to get some partial results. And guessing complete solutions is of course very complicated, but uh, it should probably be easy to get at least some simple constraints. Maybe they're not going to be as powerful as those from the numerical bootstrap, but getting some juice out of these equations seems like a doable thing. So that should be something for the near future. Um, so ultimately this, this is just a new disguise, a new guise for on bootstrap equations. I told you what I know about it now, so they, they seem to have some promise if they're really going to help solve the conformal bootstrap. Ultimately, it's not clear yet, but uh, I think hopefully in the near future we'll, we'll get somewhere at least. So, thanks for your attention.